What's going on? This is the Saturday Down South podcast. I am Connor O'Gara. Will, I'm going to be honest with you. Tough day in our house. Tough day. I did not sleep well. It is Lauren's first day back from maternity leave. Claire's first day at daycare, which I talked about mm-hmm. last week. And there's something else that I'll get to with Lad of the Week that just kind of has me a little bit down. But you know what? It's football mm-hmm. week. We have football. This weekend. We are officially in a game weekend. And for everybody that's like, oh, it shouldn't be called week zero. I've said it before. I'll say it again. Yes, it should. Because how weird would it be if this were called week one and then everybody else, 90% of college football teams were starting during week two. It'd be like, why is opening weekend week two? This is a dumber thing to have to explain than to have to explain to the random person. What do you mean you're watching week zero college football? So just embrace week zero. Understand that the slate is eh. It's a little, little teaser, a little appetizer. Nothing wrong with that. We can accept it. It's football week, and that's a good thing, and that's enough to bring someone like myself out of a little bit of a, of a Monday funk. Yeah, no, 100%. I'm with you. It's like when people used to have zero period in high school. It's like, hey, if you're an overachiever, if you want to get out of here early, go for it. Um, if you're Northwestern, hey, it's the high point of your season. But exactly like what you said, it's like these games are a little bit unserious. They're a little bit fun. So there's no reason to start 90% of the schedule on two. We're going to make this is not one. This is 0.5. It's like Lion Lion King one and a half. Um, It'd be a tough thing to have to say on air. But look, we're going to we're going to get Notre Dame in Dublin. That's going to be fun. Um, Mm -hmm. It's we're going to get Vandy hosting Hawaii. Who knows at what stadium what that's going to look like. Going to have more of a breakdown on that later in the week. Uh, I say that just a little bit tongue in cheek, but yeah, this slate is what it is, but it's a football week. And that is a beautiful, beautiful thing. We have a great show lined up. Chris Budden, who does a fantastic job with ESPN. She's going to join us. We've got uh, upset picks that we're going to talk about in bold and brash and then lad of the week. But first crystal ball season began last week with the West. Today we're doing the East. I have, uh, I think I have a lot more upsets in the East. And I think that just kind of speaks to the parody, or at least maybe they're perceived upsets. But let's start with my order of finish, overall record, conference record. You can pick this apart as you see fitting. So seventh, I still have Vandy, although it's close. Kind of, sort of, not really. Five and seven overall, one and seven in the SEC. Sixth, Florida, which sounds really bad, but it's not as bad. And I'll get into that. At six and six overall, three and five in the SEC. Fifth, Mizzou, six and six overall, three and five in the SEC. Kentucky, seven and five overall, three and five in the SEC. Tennessee at eight and four overall, four and four in the SEC. South Carolina also eight and four overall, four and four in the SEC. But South Carolina gets the tiebreaker at second. And then Georgia, obviously, 12 and 0, 8 and 0 in the SEC. What stands out to you? All right. Read these from top to bottom, but just the first four. Georgia first, South Carolina second, Tennessee third, Kentucky fourth. That's what sticks out to me. I think being – so I like the boldness to be that high on South Carolina. Um, I'm interested actually that if you were going to put them ahead of Tennessee, you didn't also have Kentucky ahead of Tennessee. Um, those are kind of the two teams I'm going back and forth with are Kentucky and Tennessee. Not that I'm super low in South Carolina. Um, I just – I think – I, I'm kind of a little bit bigger on Tennessee, I guess, you know, with um, a new quarterback coming in, with Liam Cohen coming back. But, yeah, I think that's uh, – is that – I mean, you, you're a lot more dialed in than I am. Is that a bold pick for South Carolina, or do lots of people have South Carolina up there? It's bold, but then it's bold probably more because of I have them going unbeaten in non-conference play and beating Clemson again. Mm. The boldness is the the fact that I have them – repeating last year with beating Tennessee and beating Clemson again. But if you look at it and say, well, you know, it's bold to say that they're second in the East, but I have them four and four in conference play. It's not like I have them going right. five and three. It's not like I'm saying they're going to go six and two and really give Georgia a push. No, I, I think that you look at two through six. I mean, two through six, I have going either four and four in the SEC or three and five. That's it. There's not a whole lot of wiggle room there. I know what else you might be thinking looking at that. <clears throat> I alluded to this last week. Who do I have Vandy beating? It's a crossover game, Will. I got a beating old mess. Yeah. Okay. Shout I out to see that. Shout out to Lane for quote tweeting my crystal ball. Um, 
he tweeted out that I had him at six and six and he said, thank you with a crossed out devil emoji, a chair and a plate. I think that means no rat poison. I don't know. I, was, I feel like the rat emoji was right there. That was a little bit too cryptic. He's getting like Cam Newton territory almost there. Yeah, I, I don't need to get into the hieroglyphics just yet. It's a little bit early. I'm not mid-season form for that, but um, mm-hmm. you are welcome, Lane Giffen. Given Ole Miss all the ammo it, it possibly needs. Ole Miss fans who are listening to this who are upset that I would suggest that, that upset. Vandy beating Ole Miss, doing so in Oxford. Okay, I, I, get, I get the pushback. Nobody wants to hear, oh my gosh, we're going to lose at home to Vandy. Might I remind you of a couple of things? Vandy led by 10 in that game with a minute left in the first half. Mm -hmm. Then Vandy basically just forgot how to cover Jonathan Mingo. It was a blowout. It was ugly. He had like a billion receiving yards in the second half. Something else. Florida and Kentucky both spent time in the top 15 last year and lost November games to Vandy. The notion that Ole Miss is above that kind of loss is kind of foolish. It, it is. And they have a really tough four-game stretch right before it. And this could be one of those sleepy 11 a.m. starts. Maybe Judkins is a little bit banged up. The offensive line isn't exactly firing on all cylinders. A.J. Swan comes in, and they're just throwing the ball over the place with Will Shepard, who had a big day in that game last year. It wasn't quite Jonathan Mingo territory or anything like that. But could I see something like that playing out? Absolutely. I really could. I don't know that Ole Miss's floor is good enough to be able to overcome that. And I think that they're the type of team that could fall victim to that if they are not saying at the the jump, hey, we're going to come in there and punch you in the mouth. I think they could have issues Mm -hmm. with a team like what Vandy is going to be able to bring to the table this year, which again, I say that a little bit tongue in cheek, but at the same time, I do think year three of the Clark Lee defense is going to be better. And I'm predicting a regression in terms of SEC wins for them. So I'm only saying one, and that's the one that they get. Am I stupid for saying that? Um, I'm now rooting for this so hard simply <laughs> because, you know, we talked about this with South Carolina and Kentucky as far as two coaches that are just so different that they almost have to have a beef. Clark Lee and Lane Kiffin might be the most two different coaches in the SEC. And if this happens, the press conferences after that are going to be electric. Because it's just going to be like Clark Lee staring at, at the camera like it's like WWE or something. You're just being like, we told y'all. We had we had this one. We told y'all. And then Lane Kiffin would just be sitting there looking sad. And he would just – there would be some official he would be mad at. There would be some – the weather was wrong. The grass was too long. Something. And I ruining actually, the sport. Yeah. He's and like, ruining the sport. We can't even beat Vandy anymore. The guys are too focused on their Instagram handles. Something like that. But I actually – this would be – other than like some insane, you know, like Vandy beating Georgia that would just never happen. This would be such a nice upset if I could just have one. I think that the the, the fallout from that would be so great because if Ole Miss does regress in this way that you predicted them to, now you got to think Ole Miss is starting to be like, oh, what is this guy that we have in Lane Kiffin? You know? Okay, so let me let me let me bring you bring Ole Miss fans back on my side here. Okay, who who gives Georgia its most competitive game of the regular season? Not Tennessee, not Kentucky, not Auburn, not South Carolina. Ole Miss. Mike Bobo. (laughs) (laughs) The sleeper cell. Yeah, a little bit. This will be the Ole Miss spectrum in 2023. And I realize this is the East Crystal Ball, so I'm I'm not going to go in depth on Ole Miss. Listen to the last pod. We did plenty of that. I -hmm. think this is the only time that Ole Miss at Georgia game, right? Late in the season. That is the second to last game of SEC play for for Ole Miss. You look at this game, and I think this is the only time in the regular season that Georgia is pushed in the fourth quarter. Here's why. I could see a world in which a very experienced Ole Miss offensive line actually hangs tough against Georgia in Athens. Just, we've got nothing to lose. We're going to go for it. After Georgia has just totally dominated everyone at home the last home game of the year Tennessee is the following week I could just close my eyes and picture this in-game updates my guys Matt Barry Dari Noka they're like is Georgia looking ahead to Tennessee Ole Miss hanging around hanging around maybe the game plan's a little bit Bobo-esque conservative who knows maybe the Jackson Dart moments that everybody's been waiting for it just kind of happens those first three quarters Lane schemes his tail off. He and Charlie Weiss Jr. are high five and going crazy. I think he's up in the booth, but maybe they're, 
you know, the, the vibes are just high on that old Miss sideline. You've got Knox out there doing the fire extinguisher thing. I don't know if he's going to do rules. that on the road. Maybe. We love Knox. Who knows? Yeah. Don't forget, though. Don't forget this. Lane used to go up against that Kirby offense for two years at Bama. Okay. Kirby defense, not Kirby offense. Lane's offense, Kirby defense. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I think he's going to have a trick or two up his sleeve. I do. I really do. But then maybe it's like a tie game going into the fourth quarter. And then Carson Beck does his best Stetson Bennett imitation. Jackson Dart throws a late pick. Georgia hangs on. And the spin zone coming out of that one is any given week. Maybe it's a little bit of, oh, it's good that Georgia finally got to play in a close game. I think that's the the game that makes Georgia go, oh, okay. Maybe we are a little bit vulnerable. And then they come out and dominate the second half against Tennessee. So that's it for Georgia. That's all. That's the only like real legitimate scare that I have for him. Not worried about the running back injury situation. Not worried about some of the questions on the defensive line. Definitely not worried about recently anointed QB1 Carson Beck. I am worried about Bobo. We've talked about that a lot, but that's more so worried about him in a championship setting, not in a regular season setting wherein they could be vulnerable and actually lose a game. I think Kirby does something that Saban has never done before. Three consecutive 12 and 0 starts. Think about hmm. that. I mean, look, there is all the great things that Saban has done. And people will say like, well, the West is more difficult than the East. Understand that hundred percent. Saban has only gone 12 and 0 in consecutive seasons once. And it was 2008, 2009. That's it. That's a, that's a hard thing to do. And here mm-hmm. Kirby is sitting here and he's done it two consecutive years with a 12 and 0 start has really good chance to do that three consecutive years. So that's kind of how I see it playing out. Probably don't need to spend a ton of time on the Georgia crystal ball, but if they aren't 12 and 0, man, whew, the takes going into that sec championship will be all over the place. Yeah, we will have convinced ourselves, or a certain fan base will have con- convinced themselves that this is the best Georgia team of the three. Um, let me just run through these two really quick. So you think uh, that game being in Knoxville does not matter? You think that's, I, I mean, Tennessee's well. team. I, I yeah. can't, I can't, I can't be as out there as I was last year, be that mm-hmm. wrong, and then double down. I just can't, okay? I'm, for now, I am, I'm just going to, I'm in wait and see mode with Hypel getting over the Georgia hump. Because man, they yeah. came out on a mission, and that was that that wasn't as close as the final score indicated, and it was a game in which your best <laughs> yeah, quarterback. Sure <laughs> it really wasn't like your best quarterback since Peyton Manning struggled immensely. Your Blitnikoff Award winning receiver couldn't break free. Like Georgia just took everything away in that game, and it's I can't sit here and say. Oh yeah, Joe Milton's going to be is going to be Georgia. I just can't. Yeah, I mean, this feels like kind of a gap year Tennessee team. Who's the new quarterback they have, Connor, coming in? Nico Iamaliava. Yes, so we have some time, obviously, before he's you know behind center. So this is a little bit of a gap year. I think this is more of a stay above water year for Tennessee. Like, find your floor versus find your ceiling. Last year they had you know three of the best receivers we've ever seen in the SEC, as well as a great quarterback. And again, like you said, they just got beat to sleep by Georgia. So there's really no reason. I'm, I'm kind of with you. There's no reason to think that this team, I mean, because Georgia's defense had lost a ton from the year before either way, you know, so it wasn't even like this all time Georgia defense. So yeah, I'm right there with you. The other one is of course the other team that played the, the team that did actually play Georgia kind of close Kentucky. No feeling there. You don't think that they have a shot? No, I don't. Um, I don't not, in, not in that particular game. And Part of me, part of me is really interested because you weren't going to beat Georgia playing the style that they played prior to Liam Cohen's arrival. So basically, it's it's run heavy. You're not going to be throwing the ball, going over the top. You don't really have two or three pass catchers where you're going to get burned for a 40, 50 yard play. But at the same time, you kind of look at the last two years and you're like you've scored 19 points in this matchup. Six of those yeah. points came because Kentucky was trying to cover the spread. You can't convince me otherwise. That play at the end of the 2021 game to Wandell, where they're just like, they're on the goal line, four seconds left. They're just doing whatever they possibly can to score a touchdown in that instance. I don't think that that matchup, as much as I'd like to be able to say that could be fun, I don't think that matchup is particularly good for what Kentucky is trying to be this year. I think their secondary mm-hmm. is able to kind of handle 
Kentucky's receivers. I think it's going to be really tough sledding for those guys to be able to get open. And man, Chris Rodriguez was the ultimate like run through contact guy. And even he, they kind of hit that point last year where they're like, oh no, we really, I mean, the last two years with him, like we can't even just run you up the middle. We got to kind of get creative with what we can do with you. I don't know that this is a big Ray Davis game. So yeah, no, I, I can't get on board with it with a Kentucky upset in Athens. And I have something else I'll get to with Kentucky on the road against like legit quality top 25 competition and why that prevents me from being as high on them overall and why I could limit their upside this year. Cool. That's all I had on that. Okay. South Carolina. Um, South Carolina is second. The, the upsets that I brought up before beating Tennessee and Clemson again, also losing to Mizzou again. This, this is how the East is going to play out this year. My belief in South Carolina stems from the fact that they have become just one of the scariest teams to play in November under Shane Beamer. Mm -hmm. How do you game plan against a team that can just have anyone on the roster scoring touchdowns? Like we talk about Beamer ball, whatever. I, I get it. Even that lone touchdown against Florida was a fake punt from Kai Kroger. Okay. Like the ways yeah. you could just have these guys that just pop up out of nowhere. And you're like, Xavier Leggett, Josh Van, like these guys have been invisible all year. What do you mean they're going off for a big touchdown? Do we know when Spencer Rattler's best games are going to be? No, we really don't. You can go into a game thinking this is the exact way to defend him. I'm sure Tennessee had a game plan. It's like, hey, this is how we're going to be able to contain him. And instead, he delivers one of the better games that we've seen from any quarterback in the playoff era. Like that is, that is not hyperbole to say that he was that dialed in. And if you don't believe it, go back and watch some of the throws that he was making on that night. He can make those game changing throws. Only a handful of guy in the sport can. And as we saw against Clemson last year, he can also have a bonehead mistake or two, like on at a very critical point in the game. And then on the very next drive, he does something to make up for it. And you're like, all right, this is, you're, you're back in business. You're good to go. Notre Dame had a little bit of that as well in the bowl game. South Carolina is inconsistent. Four and four is the mark of an inconsistent team. But I think they start off 0-2 in SEC play, losses at Georgia. And then I think they lose at home against Mississippi State. And then boom, right Not after that. Not on family weekend, Connor. Yeah, it is a family weekend. It's, it was, uh, Shane Beamer's uh, his father-in-law is the sheriff in starkville as, as like the deputy something in starkville or something like that yeah it's where he this is why i always like to make jokes with you because sometimes you just got a nugget like that and i'm like ah how about that yeah he, it's where he and his wife met yeah he was working on sylvester croom staff at mississippi state and yeah so a little bit of a family reunion uh so to speak but yeah i think mississippi state goes into columbia and wins that game south carolina actually starts off zero and two in sec play and then right after that that's where they start to pick it up. That's where I have them being that desperate team going into Tennessee and winning that football game. Seven wins as an outright underdog, four wins as a double digit dog, all of which came in November or later. That's been the MO for Shane Beamer so far. The only real upset I have for South Carolina in SEC play is winning that game at Tennessee. And it's kind of amazing to me that some have just chalked it up to the atmosphere of that, of that night. It's in, looking at this matchup this year, even South Carolina people that I know very well, they kind of have ignored the pieces coming back. Like Spencer Rattler, Juice Wells, DeCarry and Joyner, who had two rushing scores that day, and he's going to be RB1 mm -hmm. this year. Those guys are all back. Tennessee still has Tim Banks running that defense. It's still a group that was among the five worst in the country against the pass. Number 12, 112 in the country, allowing 20-yard passes. And I know, like, Tennessee secondary is loaded with experience, a bunch of seniors, Slaughter, McCullough. But I, I just wonder if that group is going to be a liability against teams that can actually stretch the field. And so that's why I have that South Carolina upset happening again. Tennessee fans, you might call me crazy, but it probably sounds like I'm really anti-Tennessee right now, but I'm not. I don't think I am. I do have one more anti-Tennessee thing. though. <laughs> I've got Tennessee losing to Florida in the swamp. Wait, 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 hold on, hold on. Let me really quickly go back to South Carolina. So, okay, their four SEC losses are Georgia, Mississippi State. Who are the other two? The other two are at Mizzou and at A&M. <laughs> okay. <laughs> that is the strangest, but that's, like, actually pretty fitting for Shane Bieber. It's not as strange as it was last year, now that they say that. So you have them 
beating North Carolina. So they'll probably go yep. into the Georgia game ranked if they do that because North Carolina is ranked. So they'll probably creep into like 24, 25. That'll be a ranked win that Georgia fans get to talk about all year. And then uh, then you have them losing to AM, who we both think is going to be pretty good. The upset is Mizzou, but you think by virtue of upsetting Tennessee, they then finish second in the SEC and get a, in the SEC East and get a sake bowl game. I mean, yeah, I, I think that Beamer and his teams are always very weird. So if you're going to pick a weird team, this is going to be a weird team. Almost no matter what, because they either struggle at everything or they just come alive and they're like this Dr. Octopus Cthulhu that just does everything right at the same time and scores 63 points. So yep. who's to say? Um, but anyway, moving on. They get into the top 25 and then immediately they're like, oh, no, maybe we don't belong. That's that's going to be <laughs> nope. how this would fall. Just because kidding. You're exactly right. They beat, they, they win that game against UNC and they get off to a good start in non-conference play. And then the Georgia game happens. All right, you're out of the top 25. You lose to Mississippi State even further out of the top 25. And then all of a sudden you win at Tennessee and then you beat Florida at home. And it's like, oh, you're legit. Just in time for mm-hmm. the Mizzou game and you get to lose that one. Like that would right. be that would be kind of the the path that South Carolina has has followed. And then, oh, by the way, you're peaking at the end of the year. You win your final two in SEC play. After a two and four start to SEC play, by the way, you win those final two against Vandy, against Kentucky. You get to four and four in SEC play. You beat Clemson. You go into the bowl game with all this momentum. And just like that, we're having the same conversation that it feels like we're always having about South Carolina. That's just been the way that it's gone so far under Beamer. Um, okay, so the other upset. Haven't seen a lot of people with this one. Tennessee losing to Florida in the swamp. It's been 20 years since Tennessee won at Florida. 20 years, Will. How old were you in 2003? Gosh, 2003. Yeah, it would have been. Well, that's not. Yeah, yeah, it would have been uh, eight. Yeah, I was in middle school. I was in middle school. Don't remember watching that one. Uh, Chris Leak took over QB1 duties that day. Like, Got the the Mm -hmm. next start after that. The rest is history. Um, So, yeah, I I think after breezing through non-conference play, even the UTSA game, the tricky UTSA game, which I think is before that that game at Florida, if I'm not mistaken here. um, I think we look at what Joe Milton has done well, and everybody's sipping the Kool-Aid, and then it's the back-to-earth game. Austin Armstrong, your 29-slash-30-year-old Defensive coordinator hire. He's 30 now. Mm-hmm. He like just turned 30. He dials up all the pressure in the world. We get a couple of Joe Milton interceptions. I think Florida gets those short fields that it needs to figure out, just get some positive momentum early on with this offense as they're figuring things out with Graham Mertz. I think Trevor Etienne runs wild in this one, like career high, 150 yards. Napier doesn't abandon the running backs like he did last year in this game. And a Florida offensive line that only has one returning starter kind of comes into its own. Florida finds a way to beat Tennessee in the swamp once again. Am I going to get in trouble for that one? Probably. Maybe a little bit. Um, No, I think to your point, I mean, that game was a lot closer than I think people want to remember last year, you know, with the narratives that we had for both teams. I mean, that was a game that – Anthony Richardson was like chucking it towards the end zone at the end of the game. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think that uh, like Florida just didn't go away, and obviously Richardson's different from Mertz. You know me, not a huge Mertz guy, but I think that the key is exactly what you've just said, which is that Florida's ground game kind of should have propelled them, and hopefully, you know, in year two, Billy Napier understands that Tennessee. I I have never seen the Josh Heupel team stop the run. I'm just like I don't care. I'm at this point where all right. And I last think that, year they're all right against the hmm? run last year. They, I think they were 21st in the country against the run last year. Yeah, but in the course of that game and to start the year, that was the thing. Like, I remember they, and I'll even go back the year before, they started off unable to contain the run. And then maybe yeah. they, like, figured it out as the year went along. But I, I'm remembering, like, a pit game, I think, where there was just this, what was a oh, boy, I bet a Kanda that was just going yeah. crazy. Um, so, yeah, I, I feel like they, the pace that they play with, whenever you get a, a guy like Billy Napier who could just gash you on the ground, um, you know, they can start getting off the field. Florida can stay on the field. And like, that's like, I've been saying about Florida, you know, that's the style they want to play. Like maybe Anthony Richardson just didn't fit their style. They want to hold the ball. They want to just get five, six yard runs and almost like Utah does in a way, but obviously they like to have kind of that same mobile quarterback, but they don't have it now, but he's committed. You know what I'm saying? So point being, that's the style of ball that Florida likes to play. It's almost the opposite of the Josh Heupel because Josh Heupel is looking for the big home run play. He's looking to set that up. Whereas Florida is just going to beat you to sleep with six, seven, eight, 15 yard runs. Um, and I think that's Tennessee just doesn't have the depth to really 
stop that, especially in the early season before the whole thing kind of gels together. So I really could see them jumping up and uh, surprising them. And that is game three right before UTSA. To check on oh, right before UTSA. Good call on that yes. one. Yes. Um, yeah, looking ahead to UTSA, some people are saying. <laughs> so they may be looking ahead to UTSA. That's what I'll get them. Hey, look, I, I was, when UTSA is showing up in the top 25, hey, they're, they're probably not going to be sleeping on that one. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, that could be a blessing in disguise for Florida with the ground game specifically. As much as it was great to have a guy like Anthony Richardson who could just at a moment's notice – just take it to the house, 75 yards, somehow get faster 60 yards downfield like he did against LSU. I realize a game in which they still lost. That was the point mm-hmm. you were going to bring up. Um, but one of the nice things about not having that mobile threat of quarterback, Montreal Johnson, Trevor Etienne, those guys should be able to get into even more of a rhythm. And they're not going to have these moments where, like, I looked up at the end of the Tennessee game, and, I'm, and I realized the offense wasn't the problem. It was the defense. But I'm like, how did those guys only get the combined 17 carries or whatever it was? Florida should have still been able to run with those guys effectively in that one. And maybe there were things that I wasn't seeing that Billy Napier was with the way they loaded the box, whatever the case, I think it's a different story with them running the football this year. And they take advantage of that in the swamp. Should I say some nice things about Tennessee? I feel like I'm overdue for that. Sure. <laughs> I think we see the best version of Joe Milton. Yeah. We like Joe Milton a lot. That's the thing. That's the thing. Most people have to be convinced on is we both like Joe Milton. It's the other things that we're not crazy about. <laughs> Here's the thing though. The best version of Joe Milton is not what people think it is. That's the okay. biggest thing that people are misconstruing in the offseason. Like people are saying, when you say that he's ridiculously talented, I don't think it means that he has the upside to be one of the five best quarterbacks in college football. When you say he's ridiculously talented, it means he can do things over the course of the game that very few human beings on planet Earth can do. And I believe mm-hmm. Joe Milton is capable of that. It's not, I don't think he has Heisman level upside. That's not like, I don't think he's consistent enough from an accuracy standpoint to just all of a sudden flip the switch and have that part of his game be okay. I don't think he has that ability. And to be honest, like he's a good runner. He's a good running quarterback. Is he elite? No, probably not. But I think he will make some of those plays. You're just like, that was awesome. That was Mm -hmm. third and 14. There was absolutely nothing there. Look at what Joe Milton did. And he just keep the chains moving. That's why it's awesome to have a guy like this, a quarterback. I think Joe Milton has plenty of those moments this year. But I think it's up and down. One second, he's going to throw a 65-yard touchdown pass to Dante Thornton off his back foot. And then the next, he's going to sail a 10-yard out into the fifth row. That's still going to be part of the Joe Milton experience. Don't misconstrue talent with upside, okay? Those, Those can be two different things if you look at it from a big picture standpoint. The good news is that I think Tennessee... And I think Heupel specifically is going to recognize the days where he needs to just lean on that ground game. Ground game should be fun. It's a three-headed rushing attack with Small, with Mm -hmm. Wright, with Milton. That should be one of the best in college football. I mean, they should really be able to lean on some teams. And I understand dealing with some preseason injuries, the the injury to Mays, you don't like to see that. I still think that Josh Heupel, set it and forget it, with him having one of the best ground games in college football. I think mm-hmm. against a team that isn't ready for that, like AM, what I talked about last week, that benefits Tennessee. And they just come out and they smoke them, and it's ugly. I also think Joe Milton doesn't start every single game because I think Nico starts one game. He starts one game. I think he starts that UConn game, November 4th. Nico who? Nico Iamaliava. We're still going to crush that pronunciation. We're going to get that right every time. If we're getting One DJ, of us will, but it could be a group project if you want. <laughs> if we're getting DJ Uyangalale right, okay, in year four, no big deal, mm-hmm. we're going to be just fine with Nico. We're going, to, we're going to get that squared away. I don't think that that him starting on November 4th is all of a sudden like, oh my gosh, Joe Milton's going to lose his starting job. I don't think at that point he's going to be in Heisman contention, but it'll be understood and Heupel's going to do a really good job of communicating this, something that he might he, he hasn't had to do so far because he hasn't had someone as talented as Nico coming in. I don't think mm-hmm. he's going to be like, oh, yeah, we're going to try him out and see how this goes. He's going to say this is not a benching. We're going to try out our true freshman. We need to get him ready for next year. Let's see what we have. So if this is the case, and this is how Tennessee's season plays out, if this is what the crystal ball says, where Nico looks the part, Joe Milton's an NFL draft prospect. Maybe he's not a round one guy, but he's at least an NFL draft prospect that's going to make a lot of front offices drool with some of the traits that he has. I know. I said the word trait. How dare I? We (laughs) get Josh Heupel's sixth consecutive top eight offense. You get to a Florida bowl game. That's not some massive letdown. 
we don't have to retroactively say, oh, Tennessee actually wasn't back in 2022. I think we could still look at what Hypo is building and say, this is a great place to be. I mean, it was the last time you felt that good about a program post year three. I think that would be perfectly fine. Is that a yeah. fair breakdown for this team coming off of their best season in 19 years? Yeah, no, I mean, I think we're both in the same boat. That it's like, hey, it's just structurally sometimes, you know, you got to take a little step back. I think they hit on all the transfers. They did a great job developing last year. And like I said, I mean, that receiver core, the passing game, and I mean, the whole offense was honestly awesome last year. Um, but yeah, I think that, you know, if, if your floor, if you're in a, a stopgap year and you're eight and four and you're in the conversation for second in your division in the SEC, and I mean, you're, you're saying, you know, it's going to take an upset to put them third. So, I mean, either way, we're kind of aligned that, Tennessee is it's a whole new era at Tennessee I mean that's hate to say Tennessee's back right but if we're both a little bit conservative versus what the expectations could be and we're still like yeah eight and four feels about right you know and and knowing that they have all these guys coming in I, I think that's awesome and yeah, as you've said there are probably gonna be some games where Melton struggles I think that A&M probably is a game that he won't struggle I think it's probably be a great game I think that Florida depending on how they play him that's why that game plan is just so like like, we want Florida to be fun. That's the thing. And if Florida comes out there and just says, hey, we're just going to leave these DBs on an island, it could be very bad for them as well. But if they do the game plan right, so that could be a really one or two ways game. But yeah, I, I could see, you know, the games where Milton plays really well. And then I could also see the games. And, and when you talk about Alabama and why they're going the way that they are, probably it's to limit games like they had last year that were in the late <clears throat> or in the high 40s. So I, I think Alabama is probably a game they're going to struggle just because Alabama is trying to, again, shrink the clock. Uh, joyless murder ball, as you yep. said. Yep. They're going to, um, you know, they're going to try to try to not make mistakes, try to force turnovers. And I think that actually will be a little bit of a, a tough scene for Tennessee in this situation just because of those styles are going to clash. Yeah. And if you're still doing things like, okay, you're, you're winning at Kentucky, you're – beating a team that's well within the top 25 in Texas A&M. Um, you don't look like a total doormat at Bama. I, I think those things are still going to be considered positives. And if they're sitting there after this year with nine wins and you know that Nico's coming in, the hype's going to be off the charts. And this this could mm -hmm. still be a, one of those teams that starts off in the top 10 because like that's just the way that it works, especially when you're one of these big brands and especially – if Josh Heupel can get this full circle project that is Joe Milton to play out the way that he hopes it can this year. So you talk about Florida. You want Florida to be fun. I think I've created a pretty fun path for Florida. Okay. Six and six, but not fun all Fun for them or six. fun for me? Because those are two very different folks. <laughs> it's, it's, they're, they're a candidate for our Sickos Committee Team of the Year. They're up there. Okay. Um, I don't know that they're leading the clubhouse, but they are uh, – they're, they're going to have some fun if this projection plays out. If I told Florida fans you're going to be six and six, like, oh, God, this sucks. Billy Napier, we're going to be talking about his job security. I don't think he's getting paid $31 million not to work. Is he going to be the hottest seed in America going into next season? Maybe. But think about this. If six and six includes a home win against Tennessee, and then a playoff spoiling victory against Florida State. He'd be like, mm, all right, got something. That's that's a fun way to kind of bookend the the power five slate. So well, I guess it's not the power five slate, but those would be two huge moments for Billy Napier. Florida mm -hmm. beating Florida State is one of my biggest upsets. Well, think about this. Do you remember watching Florida, Florida State last year? Boy, do I. And they're one receiver. Oh, it was one receiver. I'm glad you brought that up because I, I remember sitting down on Black Friday, which is the single most underrated day of the college football calendar. And mm -hmm. Florida did have that one receiver. That one receiver was Ricky Pearsall. And poor Ricky Pearsall is running out there with like six guys with walk-ons who are working part-time jobs in the offseason because their receivers are just decimated with injuries right and anthony richardson in that football game went over 36 minutes without a completion that's 36 minutes of game time not 36 minutes of real time i think it was two hours of real time jordan travis oh meanwhile yeah it was bad it was really bad jordan travis was awesome 
He was fantastic. He kept escaping Florida's pressure. He would go like right to the goal line and they'd have to review where he started his slide, but he was making plays all over the place. He was phenomenal that night. Florida State had totally turned its season around. It was in the midst of those six straight wins to end the season. And what happened that night? Florida had the ball in the final minute on the Florida State 21-yard line with a chance to tie with a touchdown or take the lead with a two-point conversion. And Tallahassee mm-hmm. was rocking, looked awesome. Mm-hmm. Florida State loses in the swamp this year. Florida clinches bowl eligibility that night. Billy Napier gets his biggest win to date. You talk about a marquee win, that would that would easily trump beating Utah last year. Keeping Florida State out of the playoff, even amidst a six and six regular season, Florida fans would be like, all right, that was pretty sweet. That was, that was pretty sweet. We're feeling, we're feeling pretty good. But outside of those two wins, mm-hmm. the Tennessee wins, the four state wins. Uh, yeah. Ugly, ugly losses at Kentucky at South Carolina to Georgia in Jacksonville at LSU at Mizzou. So all these games are away from Florida. That's the good news. I think there's something about a home loss for a coach with a, de- with a decreasing approval rating that just kind of hits differently. I always point to Mm -hmm. the Paul Christ example of Wisconsin last year. When that place is emptying out in the middle of the season, that was like, okay, you you can't run it back with this, even at Wisconsin, Mm -hmm. which is as loyal as it gets. But I kind of wonder about the issues that they're going to have on that offensive line. I think it's going to be really inconsistent just to to be able to make Montreal Johnson and Trevor Etienne the best versions of themselves. I think that's a little bit of a tough go. I don't think Graham Mertz is going to be doing the heavy lifting a ton. I think the Armstrong hire actually looks pretty good, but against that gauntlet of a schedule, which what ES, uh, ESPN FPI had as like the number one toughest schedule in the country or something like that. Mm-hmm. Um, I think all the pressure that's put on that defense, they when they can't generate pressure, they struggle. They really, really struggle. So it looks bad that I have Florida sixth, sixth in the division, but really, I mean, I also have Mizzou and Kentucky finishing three and five in the SEC. But Florida losing to both of them is why they don't get the tiebreaker, why they, they're at six in the East. So there's not this big gap between two and six, which is why right. I think everybody's wondering, like, who's going to be second in the East? It feels like it can be anybody. And it's also why it's kind of silly to make any prediction other than Georgia wins the division. Because if two through six, mm-hmm. I have as four and four, or three and five in the SEC, then that that ain't Georgia's level. I'm sorry. <laughs> that's, that's, that's just not. Um, do we want to talk... To, is there anything Wait, else? One was- couple, yeah, a couple of things on Florida. I think they're like this is a good example of a couple of things. So, it's crazy how within the same division, Georgia can have such an easy schedule and Florida can have such a hard schedule. And there's a couple of reasons for that. Obviously, it's the crossover game with FSU, right? It's the crossover rivalry with LSU versus Auburn. The uh, non-con, who, you know, the non-con with FSU, and then the non-con against Utah is the separation from that. With with. Whereas Georgia doesn't have that in non-conference play, right? Like, yeah, the Utah, the Utah one as well. I wasn't even yeah on that part yet. But in terms of like I said, Florida has LSU every year, and Georgia has Auburn, who is the definition of up and down. Yep. Sometimes you'll get the best Auburn team in the history of teams, and sometimes you'll just get Bo Nix running around, or even worse, which is what they've seen lately. But point being, yeah, I, 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 you know, it's it's an example of that, and it's also an example of in in this time of just you know shifting sands of realignment. It's so easy to get knocked off your perch and, and, and it's hard to get back. That's why I'll never fault the coach for using the transfer portal because at the end of the day, I mean, we see it with Florida. We keep talking about it. It's like, dang, like you have this Utah game last year, which they did a great job to win. But then, you know, they have the hardest schedule this year. They, I mean, according to the FBI, I saw that and said to you, I was like, oh my gosh, they're going to have the hardest schedule two years in a row because yep. they have this one, then the 2024 one. And it's like, yeah, I mean, it's just, they're just in a tough spot. And that's kind of what happens, you know, when you go through coaching turnover. And that's why some, some teams will cling to guys, you know, and, and, and keep that stability because Florida's just in such an, a hard spot. You know, even if they had hired Nick Saban when they hired Billy, he would have just been facing this huge deluge of hard games and pressure and all this different stuff. So I, I think he's done a fine job with where he's at. I think the recruiting is amazing. I'll give them a ton of credit. It's just it's just juggernaut after juggernaut. They got to play this year. Pac-12 champion, Georgia, FSU, who could be the ACC champion. You could you could realistically be playing three conference champions in one season, which is crazy. Um, so yeah, that's that's tough. If there's ever a time for Billy Napier to show people in the SEC that he can scheme, it's now. You have mm-hmm. to. You're going to have to scheme to win some of these games. There's a reason why that Vegas over under.
to say that Florida isn't as talented as Utah. I mean, Utah, you look at their recruiting rankings every year. You're like, okay, that's Kyle Whittingham is just developing a bunch of three-star guys. That's that's what he does. They got some Utes. That's the yeah. thing. He knows it. He knows it when you see it. But there's and there's there's scheme in that and what Utah does. Yep. Maybe that's a bad example because it's a team that Florida beat last year. But when you're looking at like how it projects for the year, you're like, okay, so even the teams that Florida should in theory have more talented, more talent than, they're still in position where they could maybe struggle with them, like like a Mizzou. Okay. Like that's mm-hmm. that was a game that was really close last year as well in the swamp. So yeah, I think that's the the tough thing. You're trying to figure out what this identity is going to be this year. You got to have an identity if you're getting eight and four with that kind of schedule. You just are. Yeah. And that would be. You got to have an identity at six and six, honestly, because yep. there's not a lot of gimmies in that schedule. Yeah. Um, I can't get there with Kentucky finishing second in the West. I can't. And in the East. <laughs> Why did I say the West? In the East. Goodness gracious. Um, the lack of sleep. I was up at five this morning. That's I'm going to use that as my excuse. It was a rough night of sleep for your boy. It really was. Oh, you're good, man. Yeah. Um. It's it's the five game stretch to end the season. It's it is so tough. It's home against Tennessee at Mississippi State, where they haven't won in fifteen years. It's home against Bama at South Carolina, and then you're at Louisville. I think they win the game at Louisville, but I have Kentucky getting into the top fifteen with a three and one start to SEC play. Lone loss coming at home or no on the road at Georgia, but then losing their final four SEC games Ugh, because. Man, I just – they're going to be underdogs, I think, in all four of those. I, I really do. And it's its not just, oh, the offensive line's not good. They're not good enough to win on the road. Like, it's hard they, – they're going to be better up front. They, they just will. But its it's hard to ignore that even with that quarterback situation, what it was last year for the South Carolina game where Will Levis is out and they just clearly could not throw the football – South Carolina's defensive line came into Lexington and just dominated. I mean, it was not even close. Tonka Hemingway played like the best game of his career. He's back. That game is in Columbia this year. We know that Shane Beamer isn't exactly fond of the Cats, not exactly fond of Mark Stoops. So I think they lose that one. Here's the issue with Kentucky, too. And I alluded to this before. When was the last time they went on the road and really beat one of those teams that they shouldn't? Like if you go back and find their mm-hmm. road wins against ranked teams during this this rise since 2018, Florida last year, where that was a game at the time, we're like, whoa, how do you like me mm-hmm. now? We got a little Toby Keith action from Mark Stoops, even though a certain podcast may or may not have been, definitely was this one, called that. That was still a flawed Florida team who finished six mm-hmm. and seven. At Tennessee 2020. Tennessee went on to go three and seven, wherein Jeremy Pruitt had a coup to get him fired. Yeah, but he didn't sure exactly. Did. End. Yeah, didn't end as a top twenty-five team. At Florida, two thousand eighteen was the last time that they beat a ranked team who really had a legit season. And I would actually mm-hmm. push back on that and say, as great as that win aged, because Florida goes on to win a New Year's Six Bowl that year. How they got into a New Year's Six Bowl and not Kentucky with the same win total, and Kentucky had the head-to-head advantage. That was a weird thing. Um, but even that was the first FBS game of the Mullen era on the heels of a four-win Florida season. So I, maybe a bit more ripe for the picking than what that number 25 ranking would suggest. Mark Stoops has done things better than any coach ever has at Kentucky, and that includes Bear Bryant. It really does. Getting those quality wins on the road that stay quality wins – that has been tough to come by, and this schedule is brutal for that. You have road games mm-hmm. at four teams who won at least eight games last year, not to mention home games against Alabama and Tennessee. So that's why I cannot get to Kentucky being that second-place team in the East. Connor, did you see the video that Josh Pate tweeted out of the accommodations for the visitors' locker room at Neyland? I didn't. I have not caught as much on Twitter since TweetDeck is now more expensive. Oh, yeah. I shouldn't say more expensive oh. now that you have to pay for it. Yeah, I haven't done that yet. Oh, Elon. Uh, but yeah, it was super funny. It was just like, imagine like this beautiful state-of-the-art stadium, but everything that the visitors see looks like an archaic, like 
medieval <laughs> situation. Like, because they were a photo, they were all, like, all the replies were like, yeah, Neelan's a jump. And then all the Tizzy was like, no, no, Neelan's really nice. And like, you could see all these nice photos of Neelan, but it's just like, like teams walking in and seeing like stuff that had been updated forever because you have no incentive because it's the visitor's locker room. So I think that like, it's underrated in college football how hard it is to win on the road is, is where I'm going with that. I'm not just randomly talking about Neelan, but I think that that's, uh, yeah, I, I think that, you know, really when you start to kind of parse it down and you go, I mean, look at LSU Alabama last year, there's no shot that that two point conversion even gets called if it's in Tuscaloosa. Um, so yeah, I think that, I think that you're, you know, you're right in that it's hard to pull out one of those wins, but at the same time, it's like, ah, you know, with the style he plays, it's kind of that like grounded pound style. I, I think that, I think those was wins are just hard to come by, especially in the East where you have like one juggernaut team and the rest are kind of in flux. But yeah, I think it's, we, we were rooting for it last year in the Ole Miss game, if you remember that. And we still, he didn't get it then. Uh, so it's got to happen eventually. This, this like away game that finally, you know, Stoops kind of puts a stake in the ground. I would say I was rooting for, I, I rooted for an entertaining game at Ole Miss. Like, I, I mean, I, I wanted to see two teams that I think we had a lot of questions about at that point in the season. How legit are they? Yeah. And, you you kind of saw that that game felt a lot more important at the time than it ended up being, but right. I still think that that is just such a a struggle if you are a team that has two winning seasons in SEC play since the Jimmy Carter administration. Yeah. By the way, saw that Jimmy Carter was trending on Twitter. I don't need that. I don't need yeah. that. I I'm gonna click on that every single time. I I may miss the occasional Josh Pay video. I'm not missing when Jimmy Carter is trending on Twitter. And very nervously clicking on that to see if, if our guy is still alive. I, mm -hmm. That's not the energy I need. It's not. Quinn with Mizzou. I haven't sure. talked. I, I feel like I haven't talked any Mizzou this off season, and I and I should because I think this offense is suddenly really interesting. And here's what I mean by that: because they've been dreadful to watch for most of the post Drew Lock era. But stay with me on this. Drink okay. said that the quarterback battle between Brady Cook and Sam Horn is going into the season. They're both going to play in the season opener against South Dakota. This is also the same guy who said that there would be a QB rotation in the bowl game in 2021. And then he's like, just kidding. Brady Cook is getting all the work. This isn't really going to be a quarterback battle. Sam Horn, for those who don't know, and I realize Mizzou fans know exactly who Sam Horn is. Number eight quarterback in the 247 composite rankings in 2022. He had to gain some weight during that redshirt season last year. He's up about 30 pounds, 6'4", 220. Fans want to see this kid play. And not just because he's the fun two-sport guy, but because eh, it's not really every day that Mizzou is bringing in a quarterback of that level, at least not as a recruit. He's a top 150 recruit. They've had some mm -hmm. really, really depressing quarterback play for the last five years. It's been bad. Sam Horn is intriguing, very intriguing. I, I should say four years because I think I just overlapped. I was about to say, Drew I think yeah, Drew Locke was in there, yeah. which, hey, if you were there, who among us doesn't remember that one game where he threw six touchdowns against whoever in the heck state? And we thought he was, uh, I didn't, but some people thought he was the next, you know, Heisman winner. Way better with him than without him. We'll say that. And yeah, they, no, that's a fact, though. They would give anything for Drew Locke to come back. Yeah, they've they've struggled without him at the position. Sam Horn is intriguing as a wild card because Mizzou is sitting there with a team that is up to number two in America and Bill Connolly's updated percentage of returning production rankings. You have the best tackle in the SEC in Javon Foster. You've got the former number one overall receiver in Horn's 2022 class in Luther Burden, who's now playing the slot. You've got Blake Baker leading a defense that returns basically everyone outside of Isaiah McGuire. A lot of people are now looking at Mizzou as well because of these new NIL rules, which if you haven't seen this, these these rules that are that are state by state and all the people that are calling for federal legislation are probably pointing to states like Missouri, wherein high school players can now make money off NIL so long as they go to an in-state school which many pointed to the exact reason that Mizzou got a verbal commitment from the number three overall player in the 2024 class. Mizzou rolling out Sam Horn would be another sign that they're just all in. They, they are, everybody's got, everybody's aligned. They are, they feel like they, they can take that next step. And maybe that buyout last year that we talked about so much, that buyout that got bumped up to $20 million dollars, Maybe it's another sign that they're all in and they have no plans on, on, on changing direction. They're just, they're, they're, they're locked in. They're, they're going straight. They're not going left. They're going right. They're, no, they are going straight forward in this new era of college football. 
that could happen, or maybe they'll go five and seven. They'll pay the twenty million dollar buyout, and they're going to start over. I don't know. I'm going six and six, and I think I'm too low. What do you think? I was about to say you did all of that preamble, and you're like, you know, they're bringing back all these people. They're, you know, they, like you gave me like eight reasons to buy in, and you're like, and furthermore, the three, they're six and six, and three and five in the SEC. I mean. I'm just over it. I've been over it for like a year and a half, honestly. I, I think maybe like we've said it, or I've said it at least, like they need to show me something and make me like care. It sounds mean, but it's like I just feel like I've seen this same Mizzou team. It's been so long since they were beating Dan Mullen and like really upsetting the apple card in the SEC East. I I need them to do something. I need them to at least be interesting if they're going to be bad. I just I, – I want – so I'm right there with you. Like I want – I'm just so sick of Freddie of Freddie Cook. I just want like get Sam get either give me a new version of him and we talked about play calling duties and all that. I get that. But give me like the veteran, like the guy that we actually sign up for whenever this guy walks out of the huddle. Give me that guy who can like, you know, command the huddle and, you know, change the play and 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 actually like move the offense down the field and not just bad experience. There are a lot of guys in this team with bad experience. Um but yeah, Luther Burden is obviously awesome. I love that about the NIL. I think that every state has a rep- has a responsibility to its own state. And hey, if you want kids to stay in state, you have nothing stopping you. Go ahead and do that every state, and then we get more legislation. So I, I have nothing to be mad at Missouri about that. But yeah, I just I want them to be good. I really do. I think it's fun when they're good. I think they're a team that I think their color scheme looks cool. I think they're they're even their bold you know yellow helmets are cool. And we like Drake. We really do. And I don't want to I don't want to dump on him or anything. But like you know, I mean, he's just been a cool guy to us. Is all I'm saying. Just like as a pod, and I think that you know he's he's an interesting guy, kind of bringing his outsider mentality to the SEC. But if you're going to be that guy who's like a you know, iconoclast who breaks down all the barriers of the SEC, do something fun. Be like Mike Leach, you know, do, do, do something weird. Make me see something I haven't seen, not just the same mid every week. That's just almost getting over the hump. So yeah, I, I think that, I mean, so who's the biggest upset that you have for Mizzou this year? I have Mizzou beating Florida. That's that okay. would be considered an upset. I have a beating South Carolina. As soon as South Carolina gets back into the South 25. So there you go. There's your big upset. So if they yeah. if they beat South Carolina, you know what I'm saying, and you have South Carolina being good, or if if, it, if let's say South Carolina is even a different eight and four, like I, I should have said that when they were talking, but or when we were talking about this is if they lose to Tennessee but beat Mississippi State, South Carolina is still a good team that probably finished rank, finishes ranked. If they beat that team, you know what I'm saying? I, I think that that's that's impressive and that's probably their best win since I guess it was the 2018 win against Mullen or whatever, or, or, or like not 20, they were, you know the win I'm talking about where, where it was just like they almost fought. I think it was 2020. It was 2020. Um, Mizzou didn't win that game. Florida dominant. Oh my gosh. Yeah. No, no that not that game, but you know, you know the one I'm talking about. There was like the, one that they, they the just, year after where Mullen gets Mullen got fired after uh, drink comes, comes to the post game press conference. Does the may the force be with you thing to troll Mullen. There Probably we some, go. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So like, and obviously that wasn't a great team, but I, like other than those couple of wins, against Florida I just don't think you know I don't think we've seen a ton from them I just want them to be free just play have fun out there is what I want to see from Mizzou and not make it this tight every Mizzou game I watch is so tight because they're in these games that's the weird thing they're in these games and and even they're in the Vandy game which they shouldn't be but they're in the Georgia game sometimes or they, they were last year it's just like how do you not like win one of these just win it and then I can talk and be happy about you you know yeah I I, I want to see the play calling and how that changes things I've credited drink for being able to hand over those duties because they needed to, right. and they have not been good enough. And you're going to watch Luther burden, walk out that door. You're going to have a really difficult time actually taking advantage of this deck that is stacked in your favor. Now with these NIL mm-hmm. rules, if you don't have some semblance of a fun offense, you have to, at this point, you can't right. bring back that type of production and I realize you lose your best receiver to Dom Lovett, who just goes to just goes to Georgia, and nobody really talks about that, like how that impacts Mizzou. It actually yeah. allows Luther Burden to move into the slot, which is I think going to be a better opportunity for for them to be able to get the ball in his hands there instead. But what I think this team needs to look like in order for me to have a different feeling about Drink than I currently have right now mm-hmm. is for them to go seven and five, eight and four. And not one, but two Toby Keith victories. That's what we need. Mm-hmm. We need more How Do You Like Me Now. I think 2020 against LSU was a big Toby Keith victory. At the time, it sure was. we thought LSU was in a much different place. That game, which got moved because of the hurricane, it moved to Columbia kind of at the last second there, like on a Wednesday, which that was 2020 mm-hmm. for you. But 
it's been one of those per year. Have a couple of those. Beat a Tennessee at home. Beat Arkansas on the road. Beat a team that you're not supposed to away from home. That's how we change our opinions of you. That's the way college football works. Um, Will, any other thoughts? That was a lot, a lot of East talk. Yeah. No, I mean, that's I, I think I got all of my hashtag thoughts in there. I think it's all good. I think uh, we've kind of covered everybody. I think that, you know, the, the big surprise, and I credit you for this, is South Carolina. I think that they're a team that, you know, they, like you said, they brought back a lot of these, you know, Swiss Army knives that they had. And the vibes were a little bit weird because they lost some of their coaching staff and they were just kind of like – it, 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 like I think their hires were a little bit underwhelming, but at the end of the day, what Beamer does is kind of so unique that it's like if he, you know, I could see this working for him if he gets his style of guy, which there seems to be a very limited number of based on, you know, the style of football he likes to play, which we still haven't totally figured out because from game to game, it's so different from what we've seen. So if they develop a consistent identity, they obviously have the former, you know, documentary participant quarterback. They have all these like weapons, you know, that I don't know what else to call them. I guess five star would be, but he was like the guy in that class. So yeah, I, I think um, I, that's another team. These, these should be interesting other than the top. Yeah. He should be fun. If, if you yeah. took nothing else from this podcast, he should be all over the place with the exception of the team who's going to win it. And it's going to be very well known quickly that Georgia's going to win the division. So, yeah. Look, if you watch zero Georgia games, this is the most competitive division in America. All right. hundred yes. <laughs> percent. All right. Let's kick it to Chris Budden. Uh, first time guest. Somebody I've wanted to have on for a while because she is just all over the place for ESPN in the fall. So here's Chris Budden. Now I'm excited to be joined by a very special guest. It is ESPN's Chris Budden. Uh, Chris, I saw that you've got a slightly new college football crew, um, which I always, I'm a college football nerd. So I always care about the announcing teams. When this, <laughs> that stuff comes out. I'm really into it. Bob with Susan. Did I pronounce Bob's last name? Right. Good job. Yeah. You can just okay. call him Bobby shoe, which is what we call him. Bobby shoe, who is one of the yeah. most underrated college football announcers. You've been with a- him for a little bit. Men. Amen. Yeah. Guys. Awesome. Um, you dumped one corny former quarterback for another i saw uh, <laughs> uh, dan orlovsky's out yeah. he's got a million nfl things going on mm-hmm. in steps rg3 to your crew how does that work when you find out what your what your like what your trio is going to be like do you just show up to that week one production meeting and, and meet him or do, does like rg3 fly you guys private to like come <laughs> spend some time at his house in texas yeah, well, um, one, I hope that RG3 has better food takes than my previous uh, analyst in Dan Orlovsky. Listen, Dan's the, the best. Um, he sees football in such a unique way more than anyone else that I've ever been around. And that was a really great pairing for him and Bob because Bob can go very deep um, in the weeds of football while also being funny. Um, so I, like, I'm excited for this pairing because it'll be a, a, a different kind of, you know, RG three brings this kind of youthful energy, still funny, um, with Bob and Bob's great in terms of sarcasm and playing off being self-deprecating. So I'm excited to see how their humor works together along with them calling games together. Um, you know, another, I feel like this is the 18th quarterback analysts that I've worked with, but they obviously uh, are great about being able to see the games on all levels. Unfortunately, I didn't get the invite about the private plane, but we did have all together the three of us on a Zoom call to get to know each other, to get to know each other's families, to you know try and have some sort of camaraderie before you literally, because I've I don't even know if RG knows this, but the only I've met him obviously at seminars, but the only time I've actually like talk to him or spent like a decent amount of time with him was interviewing him when I was a sideline reporter and he was being honored at a Baylor game. So that's kind of hard to go in, but listen, by week two, when you've had enough dinners and stuff, you know, that stuff's pretty seamless, but it is, there's always a little bit of growing pains, especially when you've been with the crew for so long. The nice part is like Bob with Schusman's kind of like my work husband between basketball and football that we've come together. Uh, that, you know, we like the two of us, like know each other's families were Christmas card buddies like that. That part's pretty nice. You you should approach for the private plane. That was, uh, that was all I, I wanted. Out of that. I mean, I also live in Dallas, so I guess I could have driven down there. True. Yeah. That's a good point. He's yeah. Cause he's, he's based in Texas. That's right. Um, yeah. And, he's in Houston. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That, that would, I'm just saying like, if you want to get to know someone, that's, that's True. the best way to do it. He's got a fin room with you guys. I mean, that's, that's how this works. Like he's the new kid on the block as much that's as true. he's well known in the sport. You realize though, when he drops an innuendo, which he does basically every time he's on the call, 
you're mm-hmm. going to have to seamlessly transition out of those. Like he's just going to leave and Bob's just going to leave it out there. And you're going to have to give us coming out of halftime. What, what exactly the visiting coach said. And you're just going to be like, <laughs> well, that was weird. Thanks RG three. The good thing is my mic isn't open, but this is perfect at that time. Bob's perfect for this kind of stuff because there are things that he says And I'm like, how did you come up with that off the top of your head? I remember distinctly last year, we were covering a game and there was a player whose nickname was Woody off of Toy Story. And Orlovsky looks at Bob and says, hey, if you were going to be a character from Toy Story, who would you be? And he goes, Mr. Potato Head. Look at me. Look at my body. Of course I would be Mr. Potato Head. (laughs) Like without even thinking. He's just so good at self-deprecating humor. So I am kind of excited for whatever sexual innuendo gets dropped and how uh, Bob seamlessly works his way out of it. Yeah, Woody Marks. Yeah, tailback Mississippi State. Every, yeah. He did not. Yeah, he got his nickname from Woody from Toy Story. Yeah, being able to to deal with that is going to be uh, a new a new adventure because Orlovsky was definitely not like that at all. Like his <laughs> his bad food takes, you'd have to find a way to justify or just make fun of him on air because they're so bad. They're so bad. How does someone go viral for that many bad food takes? It's unbelievable to me. It's but it's now it's his thing. Like also, but it's. That's also who he is. Like I could order for him at a restaurant. I would like, first of all, he'd be like, how is your chicken Caesar? How's the Caesar? Is it good? Do you like it? Like we'd be at an airport. I'm like, it's an airport chicken Caesar. And he like, I like a chicken Caesar, double chicken and a Pinot Noir. (laughs) And that's just what he would get. He, we, if your post game meal was Chick-fil-A, he would just eat the chicken and toss the buns. Are we talking the buns from the grilled sandwiches or the buns from the regular sandwiches? Because from are the two regular sandwiches, things. because that's all you had. Oh yeah, the buns on yeah, the buns on the grilled chicken are not nearly as good. Yeah, they don't hold up. I, I've I've shifted to the nuggets. That's actually okay. I'll stand by Ooh. him with that one. That's that's not a bad. Tip. No, but his is because of the carbs. Oh yeah, that sucks. Yeah, his his takes are just terrible though. They're they're just so unbelievably bad. Bad. Um, the cookie okay, so- one gets me. The cookie one. What, like what's his favorite the, cookie is uh, oatmeal raisin. Like, no, that's not real. That's not. He's just doing that to troll. At this point. <laughs> that's the, the the brand is well established. There's no yeah. way he actually thinks that. He's the first person to have ever said that on any yeah. sort of social platform. That's I don't believe him on that one. Um, can you break some news and say that you're covering Florida Utah? Are you guys are going to run it back with that? Oh, no, I wish I wish I was. That's a Thursday. I'm going to assume that that's a very high level crew game. Um, I'm not supposed to say where I'm going, although where I'm going is a lot nicer, cooler weather than the state of Texas, uh, and might be out west um, on a team that might be part of the Big Ten uh, at some point. Uh, Listen, I don't know when this thing drops. Maybe ESPN <laughs> will announce that I'm doing Boise State of Washington coming up, uh, I, which I, well, listen, I'm super excited for this weird thing about like these schools leaving and the rights. I remember last year when I was doing a Michigan game, I was like soaking in the big house because I they're gonna, I'm ne- I might not ever go there again. And then we don't get a ton of Pac-12 games. And so when we got the email about Washington, the Washington sports information director was like, Chris, you haven't been here since 2015 Apple Cup like, dang, I really haven't. It's one of my favorite stadiums. So uh, yeah, all these schools that are going to be part of the Big Ten the following year, I'm going to have to pour one out because who knows when I'll be back there. I'm thoroughly jealous. And I just realized that Michael Penix Jr. with RG3 on the call, that is just a recipe for (laughs) disaster. He had him last year. He had him last year. So maybe he got it all out of him. I don't know. He's probably just like knowing that that game's coming (laughs) up, he's going to have him ready to go. Oh gosh, I'm jealous. Husky Stadium looks... Fantastic. Oh, it's stunning. Seen, if I can go to a stadium out West, I like that and the Rose Bowl are, are neck and neck for me. All stadiums should be on the water. So that that's, I mean, that's an Rose Bowl idea. overrated uh, Husky stadium. Not also the way that the overhang hangs over the top of the stadium, the sound stays in and then you go right up to the top on the right hand corner and you can see all the boats coming in for the sail gating. It's tremendous okay. and hot take Rose Bowl overrated because every time I've been has never been for a Rose Bowl. It's been for a UCLA game, so it's half full. Mm, okay. I And I didn't get the sunset over the mountains because it wasn't you, timed properly with kickoff. Can you officially stand by that take if you haven't been to the Rose Bowl game, though? That's, that's a good question. Okay. So they're going to have to send you there 
uh, end of the year. Cause I mean, yeah, that's for a playoff. <laughs> I'll take that. Exactly. Yeah. Take that <laughs> yeah. all day, every day. Yeah. Um, so last year that opener where a little bit yeah. different weather than what you, I mean, basically the exact opposite points in the country, um, for that game last year with Utah and Florida. Um, and it was, it was awesome. I remember sitting in the Mercedes Benz press box, it'd be the last one in there, not because I was working hard, but because I wanted to watch the rest of that game. And it was, it was amazing. If you're going to be covering a game in that kind of heat in early September, like that's <laughs> the dream scenario for you, right? Like comes down to the yeah. wire like that. That was, yeah. you couldn't have been put on a better week one game. Yeah, that one was awesome. And it's we also don't get very many night games because Bob Rashusen works Jets games. We're usually a noon game so that he could get back to get to wherever Jets. Week one, there is no NFL. So it was also nice to have a rare night game. It was also raining in that game to start. So then it was like extra humid. It's like walking. I describe humidity in the South as like walking through soup. Uh, which is basically what it felt like. I remember asking Kyle Whittingham, like, how do you prepare for humidity? And what they had done is they uh, shut down like the indoor practice facility, closed all the windows and watered the field and then turned off the AC. So that at least you would have the moisture coming through. And I was like, well, I guess that's about as good of a way you can simulate it. And then it was, you know, Anthony Richardson's coming out party. I mean, you're sitting there on the sidelines and there's like these Houdini act moves. And I'm like, how the heck did you get out of that? And then throw a touchdown. And so that was really fun to be part of that. And then what I remember most about that game was going to the Gainesville airport at 6 a.m. the next morning. And I walk in and I see Cam Rising sleeping on the floor all of the Utah team just laying there on the floor sleeping because their plane had engine issues. And there's not just like a ton of substitute planes just laying around the Gainesville airport. So they didn't even go back home until like 5 p.m. the next day. And you're like, on top of everything? Because like for Utah, I I was on the Utah playoff bandwagon last year to start the season. And then you're kind of like, that does it for them. Like that one game puts them out of contention and now you're sitting sleeping on the floor of a you know a airport that's got two gates life comes at you fast really really yeah. fast <laughs> yeah that one i mean having to come back from that and i imagine like when you get a week one game like that you're thinking they're all going to be like that and i looked back at your games last year <laughs> you had blowouts City. yeah oh we are queen God. of blowouts how did how do you how do you handle that when there it's one thing to to know like over the course of a game okay, I'm not going to talk to Mario Cristobal when his team is getting blown out by Clemson. You're going to be probably the majority of your stuff, unless there's a major injury, is, is going to be coming from that side and the intel, what you're, you're trying to you know capture their vibe, what's going on. But have you had those interactions with a losing coach that stands out where his team is just getting his teeth kicked in and you have to go, like even if it's just for a halftime thing where you're tracking him down, like is there an interaction like that that stood out from last year? Oh my God. Like you probably have done a bigger deep dive into my games from last year that I can't remember. You know what I remember? I remember things like lightning delays, like getting stuck at Clemson and and missing flights. Like those things are things that I remember. Uh, We we did like, we do joke that like we're the queen of blowouts. I remember last year, Brent key at Georgia tech was like, you know, they were getting knocked around by Georgia and that's two years in a row that we've had that game. And he was, you know, it, it was also in a different situation and he's very like intense and in the moment. And I don't think anyone told him that like he needed to do a, an after halftime interview. And so when they had to stop him, he was like, what do I got to do? And I'm like, sorry, coach. I most of them are pretty good because they know it's coming. <laughs> the ones that are like the interim head coaches that don't know that it's coming. That's when you're like, hi, it's me. I'm the problem. It's me. Um, <laughs> but, but most of them are, are pretty good. Football's actually better than basketball. Basketball, when they're losing, like that's, they'll just walk right past you. They're like, I, I ain't doing this. Who's walked right past you? Um, Bob Huggins has before or Bob Huggins. I've, I have had ma- wait because we were showing a lot of replays and he'll do something like, you should have timed this better. <laughs> and you're just like, Oh God. God. <laughs> Don't have to worry about that anymore. <laughs> yeah. Right. Nice. right? Yeah. Uh, I felt bad for you in that college world series final with not, I mean, the series itself was incredible yeah. with Florida and LSU, but watching the in dugout interviews games, two games are completely over by like the third inning or something like mm-hmm. that. You've got to stick, go in there 
like, Hey, you're down 19 to five right now. Like talking to a manager who's just like, get me out of this. This is the worst thing ever. How, how, how in the world do you even approach that when it's, it's, it's that bad of a situation. And even with baseball, you know, they, they're, they're not going to give you much of anything and they just hate going through that. Yeah. There's a difference in that setting because mind you, I've also been covering these teams for, you know, in-depthly a lot over the last four weeks, given SEC tournament, regional, super regionals, and someone like Sully, who I know very well, I know what his reaction is going to be. And, and honestly, that game, we almost punted on doing the interview. And then we discussed it. And I remember Kyle Peterson being like, no, he'd be good. Like, he'll be fine. And so you approach it understanding that like, hey, are, are you going to, I can't ask you to come back from 15 runs, you know, so... I kind of, I always go pitching, pitching an offense. So, you know, what'd you see from so-and-so? And I can't even remember who started that game three, but you know, you know, and then a lot of times in those games and not necessarily that one, but when you're behind and you know, they're not coming back. Like the question is like, how do you approach the bullpen the rest of the, especially if there's games to be played. I'll tell you what was the harder one in that game was LSU all day. It was like, are we going to see Paul Skeens? Yeah. And I have to do an off the bus interview. And then I have to do a third inning interview. And I'm like, I can only ask the question so many times. Because if I ask it when I, he gets off the bus, like I'm asking the same, he's like, why do you keep asking the same question? So it was, how do I ask the same question twice without asking the same question twice? And then, and I don't know if you remember in that game, we had seen him warming up. Like I was on Paul Skeen's watch. I'm like, okay, now he's in sneakers. Now he's in socks. And now he's in cleats. And now he's not even down here. Where did he go? And he was in the batting cage and then we had cameras showing him stretching. And then we, they had put a towel over the camera. So we had obviously shown it, but I also knew that Jay Johnson didn't know that we showed it. Like he doesn't realize what, what's being broadcast on air. And so leading up, and I never tell the coaches what I'm going to ask, but I kind of felt like I listen, I, I was like, Jay, we've shown video of him stretching. I'm going to ask you the question. And he looks at me and he goes, Chris, you and I have spent a lot of time together over the last 12 days. You're good. <laughs> and I was like, and he gave us more information than I thought that he would. But I also kind of wanted to be like, don't blow me off with the question because I'm going to have to ask it. And by the time you get through Omaha and they were in our hotel and we're doing meetings in the mornings, like you've built up enough, you know, camaraderie with those coaches that like they're not going to be utter, you know, jerks to you. Yeah. And that's, that's the tough thing is that, you know, they, they know that you have a job to do. It's one thing to be kind of, you know, doing your job in those moments. It's another when you have to capture and try and not look stupid during a walk off Tommy tanks bomb. And when mm -hmm. you're going through something like that, where I, I think a lot of people just say, Oh, you got it. You're, you're going to know exactly what you're going to say in those moments. You have to react so quickly. The, the amount of time that you have to get from, you know, point A to point B to where you're asking a question that's going to be seen on national television with a moment that everybody's just tuned in. How do you, how in the world do you go about that when you know, like if you say the wrong thing, you'll probably go viral and you'll end up on sites like ours. Yeah. I think the, the thing is to not put too much into the questions and, you know, people knock the like, how are you feeling right now? Like there's a way to go about that. Tommy Tanks is a difficult interview because he doesn't say a whole lot. And so I knew going into that walk-off that he wasn't going to say a ton and he didn't say a ton, but the fact that he was, you know, a lack of words is what made it funny. You know, he was like, I don't even, I don't even know how I'm feeling, you know? And so, you know, just like, how's the heartbeat right now? Or tell me what you, what were you looking for in that pitch? And so keeping it short and succinct allows you to like not make an error, allows you not to make an idiot out of yourself. I remember when you, when you get started in this business, especially as a female, you feel like you have to fill these questions with so many stats so that you look smart to the viewer. And what you realize is, is what you're doing is like, if I was like, Hey coach, you know, like Michael Penix Jr. Three for 382 yards. He only had two interceptions. Da, da, da. You're taking their answer out of their mouth. Like what if they wanted to use that? And so the more you're comfortable, you know, with, who you are in this business, asking the easier question and the simpler question is what's best. I remember listening to a podcast with Tom Rinaldi and I've always thought about this. He was covering Nick Saban in the national championship when they lost to Clemson. 
And he said, I had to go to the Alabama locker room and interview Saban. And most of the times, like we're only interviewing the winning team, which is the nice part. Um, but he had to go interview Saban. He goes, I was like racking my brain. Like, what's the best question? What's, what's the smartest question? And he was like, the best question was the easiest question. And it just was what went wrong. And you're like, that's so easy. And it doesn't even come to your mind to think to say that because you're so racking your brain to sound smart to a viewer instead of just, that's the easiest question. And honestly, like being on radio a lot has helped too, because I'm interviewing people constantly and I'm okay asking really simplistic questions. And so that to me has helped, you know, also react to not necessarily have two to three standard questions that come up in my brain. I always have some in the back of my head, but like react to what they're doing. If Tommy Tank says something funny, react off that. I want to go back to, to how you got your start in this business. Let's just get your, your biases out there. You're a Mizzou grad. You went the real big J route. You mm -hmm. kind of just missed when Chase Daniel took off at Mizzou. Like, do you regret not taking a victory lap? Ooh, I, I was there for in what? 2000. So I actually, I didn't take a victory lap. I didn't get my first job until November. So I was kind of there. Okay. I was kind of there for a little bit of it. Um, I, I tried to take a victory lap and my dad said only if you major in business. And I was like, well, he's like, what is getting a master's in journalism going to do for your salary? And I was like, yeah, nothing. And Fair. he was like, yeah, yeah so no. So I kind of took a victory lap only because nobody would hire me. So I was around for a lot of that 2006 season. I do remember being sent. I, I have a laminated from my, what was it? 2008, I guess they finished number one, a BC above the BCS for one week until they played Oklahoma the following week. And I have that one week printed off and laminated and it sat above my desk. And then I also have back in the day when they would send out gifts to like be considered for the Heisman, Chad Moeller, the SID at Mizzou, sent me one of those things. You'd look through like a viewfinder and you'd click and you'd see all these pictures. I don't even remember what they were called, but I have one of those of Chase Daniel when they were trying to get him a, a Heisman campaign. That would work for me. I, I have not gotten one of those gifts before. I think I got like, you know what? I might've gotten something for Jordan Love a few years ago, but if I got something like that, <laughs> like the, if I had gotten the Ed Oliver bobblehead, I, I'm willing to admit I, I am not professional enough to be able to look past that. <laughs> that would work. Right? That, these yeah. things, like, you can buy me. You can buy my vote. I, I don't really care. Take like, it. Hey, <laughs> Daniel, viewfinder. That's good enough for me. This is, yeah. I'm going to bang the drum. I mean, I did year. two years of Brad Smith and two years of Chase Daniel during my time. I mean, it's pretty good. Okay. That's a pretty good run. Pretty good run. Uh, you did local TV in, in Knoxville. Did you cover the entire Lane Kiffin era? Yes. Um, all, um, uh, five months. Yeah. Was it fun? Uh, sure. <laughs> he's, he's way more comfortable in his skin than he was then. Like, I don't know if you remember, he was like on the cover of sports illustrated with like the glasses down and he was just, his dad was there. He's so much more comfortable than he is now. And I'll tell you what I do remember. I was supposed to be out playing trivia the night of January 8th when everything hit the fan, I was dressed to go play trivia. I'm, I think I'd already been drinking. And then I get a call from my news director. Like we had been told, like, look out for this. But I also knew it was like fourth down the list once Pete Carroll left for this job at USC. And then it was like seven o'clock at night. Hey, emergency press conference. And then there was this whole big to do by the time we got there because Lane Kiffin didn't want any cameras, but the radio people could keep their microphones in there. And my news director was like, we're not doing that. We're not doing that. He's like, we're either all having our, our microphones and cameras on or we're all leaving them outside. And that ended up being this big blow up that got posted and my news director ended up winning an award, but it was chaos. So then we get like, there's mattresses burning outside. People are trying to scale the walls of Neyland stadium. Ed Orgeron's calling like the early recruits being like, don't step on campus because as soon as you can't step on campus, you can't come to USC. Uh, it was, and then such began the, the Derek Dooley era. Really what happened was I moved there in 2008. My first day on the job, Pat Summit and the Lady Vols won the national championship. Uh, Bruce Pearl came back from beating Memphis, standing on a bus. And the next seven years I was there was complete nosedive. And then I left and things are back. <laughs> so I'm least, to blame. 
at least you had a buzz though for for a very sobering experience <laughs> going into that. I mean, like I would bring that up. I would Lane would probably love that if you brought that up. Oh, I got my Apple Watch going. My Apple Watch thinks I'm talking to it. I'm not. Um, <laughs> if you brought that up in a production meeting of like, hey, you cost me a night of trivia with what you did. <laughs> I just thought, Lane would <laughs> Lane would be all for that. You probably finance he your next trivia night. He would. He was like a man of like he might still be this way. Very routine. Like I, I knew the route that he ran but off, off the water, right past Calhoun's. He did like three o'clock in the afternoon every time. Uh, yeah. So that was interesting. You went from Fulmer to him, to Dooley, to um, Butch Jones. I believe I left partway through the Butch Jones era. Nothing was as good. Like Derek Dooley gets a bad rap. I love the dude. He gave us great quotes. He always knew when he was talking to a television person. You know, the, the orange dog and the um, the uh, crutches, you know, that was an, an interesting, you know, time period. But uh, he gave us a lot to work with. Okay, so power rank the Tennessee coaches that you covered. Um, content would be Derek Dooley. I loved Philip Fulmer. I loved his family. I was friends with his wife. I'm friends with the kids. I, I you know. The year before you you were in the SEC championship game, and then now you haven't sniffed one since. So that was, you know, is kind of, you know, when you look back on it, that was also a really tough year because there was already rumors he was being fired, and then they lose the Wyoming game, and then the the writing was on the wall. So um, listen, if we're doing all coaches, Pat Summits at the top of the list, and then there's no one else for 20 spots below. Bruce Fer- Pearl was always fun to cover. I loved him. I loved he just he was just easy to work with. Um, from a, uh, like a media standpoint, um, Dooley then goes Kiffin, then goes Butch Jones. And then I wasn't, yeah, Butch is last. (laughs) Um, you made this. Who was after Pearl? Oh, Donnie, Donnie, somebody for like a hot minute. Memorable. (laughs) Yeah. I saw Bruce Pearl's last remember. game in, uh, in Charlotte when they got smoked by Michigan. I was at that NCAA mm. tournament game very, very randomly. I was like, oh, that team has quit. That is, <laughs> that is the look yeah, of a coach who's about to get fired. I remember having that <laughs> thought. And then not thinking about Tennessee basketball for a few years after that, for sure. This is a funny thing about Bruce. Okay, so um, I've and I feel like I can say this now, now that his son's married. But like Bruce had this thing that like he tried to hook me up with Steven several times, even after I was like married. And so I don't, <laughs> I would like go into an Auburn practice, like shoot around. He'd be like, Steven, guess who's here? And Steven would be like, dad, stop. Dad, stop. She's married. <laughs> I'm like, I love you, Bruce, but I'm not, I'm not entering the Pearl family. Love you. <laughs> <sighs> what a story that would have been. We probably would not be having this <laughs> conversation right now. If that no, probably case. not. <laughs> Um, how tough was it to leave? Uh, the, the best sign that you love college sports is the fact that you were willing to leave Southern California and cover (laughs) college sports for ESPN. I mean, that life probably was fantastic and thoughts and prayers with all that they're going through with the hurricanes right now. But most times life in Southern California looks incredible, but coming to ESPN, did you, did you struggle with that decision? Uh, no, cause I could have stayed in California with ESPN. Uh, we left Southern California cause I needed free babysitting. Uh, and to be fair, I would have stayed in San Diego my entire life. I wasn't as in love with Los Angeles. Uh, we, you know, we were up in thousand Oaks area and you know, I don't not mean to like hate on LA, but I like, I'm from Texas where you can walk down the street and everyone says hello to you. It's not that same kind of vibe when you're walking your stroller with a newborn. But what happened was, uh, we were in San Diego for two years, left the Padres job because my husband got a coaching job at Pepperdine coaching college tennis, which everyone's like, Oh, you Malibu. That was fantastic. I'm like, we, we don't live in Malibu. I would live in someone's garage. So had baby, working for ESPN and I would literally make layovers in DFW, toss my newborn kid through TSA so my parents could watch him and then go to whatever game else I was covering on the next leg, which is an odd thing when you're handing a a boarding ticket over and it says lap child. And they're like, where's your lap child? And you're like, well, I just threw him through TSA with my parents. Like this was the the life I was living because my husband was coaching 
you know, and recruiting in Germany. And it was just, it became too much. So basically after a year, I was like, I know this is your dream job, honey, but like, this is not sustainable anymore. <laughs> like, or at some point the kid's going to walk and I can't take him on any more flights. Uh, and so we, we moved to, to Texas to be near my family and brought his family there. So the, the nice part about ESPN and my job is I could kind of live anywhere. And so I chose a state, uh, near free babysitting and, uh, no state income tax. Ah, as someone who lives in a state with no state income tax confirmed, it is great. As someone who does not have free babysitting and is in the midst <laughs> of his first day with his daughter in daycare ever, um, I can yes. tell you 100%. <laughs> yes is one way to say it. Uh, terrified <laughs> is another. Um, I, I would say that is a major plus and I'm very, very jealous of you uh, yeah. for that. Um, I feel like you've been able to go everywhere in in this job and, and even just looking at like the places that you were last year, it's kind of incredible with, with the ESPN contracts, the way that they're, that they're currently set up, but what's the place that you've maybe not been to that is maybe mm -hmm. number one on your college football bucket list besides actually being able to see the Rose bowl and providing a real take <laughs> on it besides just yeah. the UCLA game. Would like to do the, the Rose bowl game, not just go to the Rose bowl stadium, never been to the horseshoe. Uh, so that would be, uh, one that's on the bucket list. And okay. So you would think that I would have had an opportunity to go there with ESPN, never been to South Bend because well, every game that they do is on NBC. So unless I'm getting something for hoops, uh, so that's one that's on the bucket list. I feel like everything else that I'd want to go to, I've been to. Yep. Ohio state has a McFlurry machine in the press box. Yeah. What? At like least make they your did own? in 2000. By the way, 2010. press box food, like that's also highly influential. If you have non-powdered eggs and other really good things as a press box menu, then maybe I, you will persuade my, you know, analysis on your team. Non-powdered eggs? What are you talking about? You know, like when you go to a, like a not great hotel and in the morning they serve eggs, like those things start out as powder. What? <laughs> yeah. I've been eating hotel eggs for <laughs> ever for my entire, if you don't have a waffle, no, you know what? Even if you do have a waffle maker, I'm still heaping on at least four eggs. That's all powder. Yeah. Yeah. This, this changes everything. I, yeah. I need I to find a waffle house. Yeah. Oh, I don't feel Those are real eggs. That. Yeah. Um, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I want to get you out of here with some rapid fire. Just five questions. <laughs> yeah. First thing that comes to mind. Does that work for you? Yeah. All right. Uh, toughest football coach you've ever had to track down for a halftime or post-game interview? That's easy. Mike Leach, rest in peace. Uh, you literally would have to bring your tennis shoes in real fast. I did trip and fall while, while pregnant while trying to get a halftime interview from Mike Leach. Tripped over the pylon. Yep. Did you explain that to your child when they were born? No, I should. And thank goodness it was taped because... Uh, we were going to run it back coming out after half. And my husband was like, thank God, because otherwise I would be married to the person who fell on national television. I was like, how awful that would have been for you. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Got the perspective in the exact right place that it should be going through that. Yes. Uh, best football atmosphere that you've covered a game in. Ooh, that's, I mean, this is an easy take. I f love going to Neyland stadium. Like I still get chills with the coming out of the tee every single time. Um, so that top of the list over under seven wins for Mizzou this year. Ooh, can I push? Um, it's not how this works. Does that include bowl game? Uh, sure. Sure. Why not? Over eight wins. That's, that's like back in the heyday. Same thing. Yes. That would, that would be a massive, massive, uh, move in the right direction for drink. Okay. Uh, your favorite T Swift song ever. Ooh. Uh, oh man. Oh man. Oh man. Mean. Oh, do we ever I find know. out what that song was about? Cause every time I've looked up why she wrote that, it was just someone was mean to her. I don't, I just like that. It's so blatant and so catty. I just. We may have to ask Nicole Auerbach about that or Mike Golick Jr. They're more of like the inside Swifty than I am. Okay. The correct answer is actually lover, but that's all right. That's okay. Fine. I get that. Okay. Last one for you. Uh, the wildest thing you've ever heard a coach or player say in a production meeting, and please name names. 
<laughs> oh, not naming names. I've had a coach ask for injury information on the following on the opposing team, and then was shocked when we couldn't give it to him. Like we're not no. Um, the coaches are way more like. Here's what I like. I like it when a coach cusses and then looks at me and or like says something like completely, you know, just you know, like someone would say at a bar, and then looks at me like, oh, sorry, <laughs> like you're good. <laughs> You're good. Have you, have you ever heard those words before? Like, we, <laughs> yeah. we need to make sure with you that it's okay. To say this. <laughs> I've heard an F bomb before. Yeah. Yeah. You, your job yeah. is like being on a college football sideline for. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I do think it's really funny when like friends of mine, like, let's say they sit like front row and they can like hear a coach or like they're behind a bench at a basketball game. And they're like, I can't believe so and so was cussing. Like, I have such a different opinion of them now. I'm like, huh? <laughs> I mean, you think they're like not cussing at the players? Yeah. Sat behind yeah. Bruce Pearl at a game a year and a half ago and was like, <laughs> okay, all right. If you don't know Bruce Pearl, you definitely will after any sort of experience like that. Totally understand. Yeah. And sat behind his son as well, who could have been your future husband. Well, yeah. Yeah. I missed out on that one. Jeez. Uh, Chris, it's been <laughs> great. Looking forward to uh, hearing your crew this year. Now definitely have to watch the Washington Boise State. Oh, opener. yeah. That's going to be must see TV. This is awesome. That, we, that I'm, I'm pretty sure I wasn't supposed to announce. So I don't even really know if I have that game, but I might. Okay. Well, just theoretically, if you do, that works. Yeah. Bold and brash. We're talking SEC upsets in 2023. I realized we do bold and brash on a regular basis during the season. So I think that there's a difference between making an in-season pick versus making a preseason pick. Mm-hmm. And I didn't post this in Saturday Down South podcast Facebook group, which you should join if you haven't. But there's a prize. We have a prize for this, Will. And it's it's a, and it's an idea that is it, probably really subjective. We can go to a lot of different ways with it. Mm-hmm. But the best preseason bold and brash SEC upset take let's come on this here podcast, tell you about why you're brilliant. I'll tell you about why you're brilliant for making that pick. But it's got to be the best. It's got to stand out. You can't just be like, oh, Georgia's going to go 12 and 0. Not bold. Right. Not brash. We'll have you on this podcast. We will talk about any sort of bold and brash predictions in the future. If you've got the winning lottery numbers, whatever. But you will earn a date on this podcast at the end of the regular season, maybe sometime during that December window, just to incentivize us. Keep track of this. I'm going to. I'm definitely going to forget about these and I'm going to need you to, to remind Oh, us. someone's I'm, going to remind us. Honest. And the best part, I love how like my marketing brain is like, lead with that, lead with the hook. And you're like, no, I'm not putting it in there. We got to have people that are in here for the love of the game, yep. for the love of the take. And so I actually like this better. Given the amount of responses we got, now it's like, hey, surprise prize if you end up being right. And you need, so here's what we can also do. You need to show me proof that you made this prediction. Mm-hmm. Keep, I, I'm... I can only keep track of so much. I'm going to remember saying some of these, but going back and finding a post from August by the time things roll, you know, things roll very quickly through the regular season. There's no way I'm going to be able to remember all this in December. So just remind me, take a screenshot of it, make sure that you had this documented somewhere. And uh, yeah, we'll, uh, we'll let you have that opportunity. Okay. Um, I think I've already gone through my list of bold and brash Mm -hmm. predictions for this year. I don't think I've left any meat on the bone with mine. Do you want to just go to the Saturday on South podcast Facebook group? Yeah, I think we talked about one. This is the East one, obviously in the same episode. And then in the West one, it was Ole Miss beating LSU was the big upset. Um, But yeah, just as a recap. Yeah. Yeah. That's the big one. I guess Ole Miss is on, (laughs) is is on the opposite ends of both. Cause in this, it would be Vandy beating Ole Miss. In Oxford. Mm-hmm. That's probably the biggest upset I had. That, well, Florida beating Tennessee would maybe be considered a big upset. And then South Carolina winning at Tennessee would be considered a big upset once again. South Carolina beating mm-hmm. Clemson would be considered a big upset. Those all qualify. Those all play. Um, okay. Let's go to this one from Michael Dark. Michael says, "This is re- we're getting bold out of the gates here, folks. Michael Dark says Ole Miss beats Bama and LSU this season on their way to the SEC championship game. They'll get smoked for the second time this season by the dogs in Atlanta. Well, it's bold that you say that they'll get smoked by the dogs because I think that's going to be George's best, best test of the regular season. 
Um, let's bring back the Johnny Manziel moments from that doc. How many times has Ole Miss been to the SEC championship, Will? Not a ton, Connor. <laughs> I think it's zero. zero. Yeah. <laughs> Not a um, mm-hmm. Look, Lane's going to have to buck all those trends. That, mm-hmm. that path to get to Atlanta coming from the West, you're earning it. What was the last time that we said, eh, team kind of got lucky. I don't know if they deserve to be there as much. 2013 Auburn, who still beat Bama, obviously had Lady Luck on their side. Maybe mm-hmm. all of the college football gods pulling for Auburn in 2013 earned it, but still you'd be like, ah, yeah, a little bit on the luckier side. Um, Certainly not a certain LSU Tigers team that was potentially about the fourth best team in the SEC last year winning the West. That is not luck. That is all skill. If you beat up Bama, that's skill. <laughs> hey, you gotta, if, you, if you're going through Saban – Nobody's going to, nobody's going to question you at all. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah. Ole Miss 2021. That was the best regular season win total they had in 50 years. I want to say. So yeah. Um, Look, that's what we're here for. That's bold. That's brash. Jared Hallwell. I just want to say really quick, Michael Zark calling them Ole Miss. Incredible. Oh, Ole Miss. I did not even see that. Okay. Ole Miss. I like that. If, if they ever need some massive rebranding, they should go with that. Although there are plenty of moments during the 2010s in which they could have used some rebranding. So that was their opportunity probably. Jared Hollowell says, Arkansas will quickly draw attention this season when they beat LSU in Baton Rouge in week four. Uh, these are arguably the two best offenses in the SEC that are headed by t- uh, two of the best quarterbacks in college football. While most will doubt the skill of Arkansas's wide receiver room, it has more than enough talent for KJ to work with. Arkansas will be scary this year, and nobody knows it yet. Dang, well, people just taking shots at LSU left and right. That game yeah, I mean, year- I think Arkansas is good. I mean, well, okay, two players on Arkansas's offense are good. We know that, and we we like the well, I like the direction their offense is heading after last year. So. I, I was going to say four, two offensive linemen who are studs, but yeah. True. You know, who could forget? Yeah, you were right. Like they had that dude who was like obviously left off the center list because he's like switching positions. I, I understand that. But in terms of your skill, like guys, everyone knows. It's like they have, they have their like four stars or like two stars and then two like hog mollies. Um, they're all hog. But uh, yeah, I, I could, I mean, their offense is, I think, going to be awesome. It's their defense I'm worried about. But again, can't get worse than last year in a Barry Odom. So maybe their offense does the old like uh, Grantham approach. Where they just lose the the DC and they're immediately better. Who knows? Yeah, that uh, that early season game will have a much different feel than last year when Brian Kelly's on the sideline serving broth to everybody and nobody can throw the football. Probably probably a little bit different. LSU's receivers might have fun against that Arkansas secondary. Just just a guess. Harold Perkins flu game. We're gonna have Super Saiyan Harold Perkins getting eight sacks yeah. this year if he doesn't have the flu. Yeah, Harold Perkins was was limited that day, and still that's what we saw. Um, let's go to this one from Grant Haney. Grant says the biggest upset in the East is shades of 2019 with Rattler and Beamer ball storming into Athens and proving that Brock Bowers is in fact mortal human, but that's okay. And defeating the dogs 41 to 17, as far as the biggest upset in the West after losses to Miami, Auburn and Mississippi state and, a double overtime win against the ULM Texas A&M limps into the month of October at two and three. And both Robert Patrick Petrino and John James Fisher jr. Are both out of a job in Aggie land. Hand up, hand up. Cotter, you're about to laugh at me so hard. I just kind of thought his name was Jimbo. I've only known him as Jimbo. His name being John James Fisher Jr. Very similar to Bobby Petrino, and then he has a child name. And so I just assumed that was his name. It's a great callback to Robert Patrick as well. We respect Robert Patrick on this podcast. Double double overtime against ULM was what got me. That was pretty good. Uh, Yeah, Grant, you'll imagine when a trash coach would lose to ULM. Oh, goodness gracious, man. (laughs) Basura. Uh, Tanner Starr says Vandy finishes fifth in the SEC East. That is bold. You know what? Because if you're finishing fifth, you're finishing ahead of who? Mizzou and uh, Florida? Same Florida? Is that what he's saying? Yeah. Vandy finishing fifth in the East requires three. Yeah, that requires three SEC victories. 
that that's essentially what you're saying. I don't think you yeah. could be two and six and finish and finish that low in the division. Um, well, they had two last year, buddy. So they need one more. Progression says that they're going to win three. That they're going to yeah. win three and five. Look, we're going to have takes after week zero, in which we're going to be able to reassess all things, Vandy. And we're mm-hmm. going to get a nice up-close look. I did make the prediction that A.J. Swan was going to break Kyle Shermer's single-season passing touchdown record, which currently stands at 27, I mm-hmm. believe, if I'm not mistaken. Jay Cutler, not the owner of Vandy's all-time single-season passing touchdown record. Neither is my second favorite Vandy quarterback, Jordan Rodgers. Um, but, yeah, the uh, look, doors are coming. Doors are coming. They are. Heard it here first. Mm-hmm. Let's go to this one from Andrew D. Giacomo. Andrew says, South Carolina beats Georgia or Tennessee. On board with that. Um, if South Carolina beats Georgia, <clears throat> the amount of people that will say Georgia just can't win a championship, you can't put Georgia – in the college football playoff, even with one loss, right? Like the amount of people that will say that, that will be their takeaway. <clears throat> yeah, already, because like, I think they're in, they're in, they're in like Nick Saban territory now with Kirby, where I think people will just be like, oh, but you got to put them in. Like, I think after the last two years, now pre, even after one championship, I would be with you, but I think two back to back, they uh, they get the benefit of the doubt. Don't let Georgia fans believe that the media hates them because they will believe it. Well, I've already had to explain to people that Georgia winning an SEC championship at 12 and 1, even if they were 12 and 1, is getting into the college football playoff. There are people who are not of the belief that that will happen. And I'm like, oh, oh, okay. So here's the thing when you win two consecutive national championships, and when you win mm-hmm. the conference that is, oh, had its champion play in a national championship 16 of the last 17 times, we can say with certainty that is one of the four most deserving teams in the country. I'm giving this 12 and one. Georgia's getting out, is getting left out crap. Okay. But if they were to lose to South Carolina, the immediate national takeaway would be Georgia's playoff chances. Not looking very good. ESPN FPI says they only have a 20% chance now. Mm-hmm. It's like, oh, so that's, that's what we're doing with this. That's what we're doing. I actually, different. like, we didn't even consider that, or I didn't even consider that. We we're talking about potential upsets. But that, I mean, if you could pick one just, like, Super Saiyan Beamer game, I think that would be the one we would all pick. Because when you think about how Georgia wins and you think about, like, and, and you think about how it was a little bit more rigid, um, you know, before the last two years, and obviously they've changed at OC. And you think about what the good Beamer teams are like, where they're having all that fun. They're not making these mistakes that Georgia usually relies on. And like, you know, that the quarterback battle of Spencer Rattler, Carson Beck, I feel would be fascinating if Spencer Rattler had a good day. Because yeah. in that moment, you would start to see, oh, this is this guy who's old enough to 